you know, we just learned uh, obviously about your story as we watched that incredible video. And I just have to say, I don't know that I've ever met anyone that um, has been divorced and gotten remarried after seven years. So you are um, an amazing picture of Christ and his forgiveness and his ability to redeem any situation. Um, so thanks for sharing that with us. But can I just start by asking you, first of all, why do you choose to tell your story? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it wasn't always that way. And it was a local pastor in Dallas that probably about a year after we were remarried mm -hmm. contacted us and said that he was going to be doing a marriage conference on Wednesdays for five weeks. And the third week was on reconciliation and restoration. And he asked us to speak. And I'm like, why do I want to do that? Right. Why, why would I want to get up on stage and share my junk with a bunch of people I don't know? Right. And my greatest fear was public speaking. So... I, I told him in his office, no. And he said, well, I don't want you to answer now. I want you and Cheryl to go home and pray about it and call me back in a couple of days. <laughs> yeah. And that was typical uh, for Pete. And so yeah. we go back home and uh, we prayed about it. And we talked about it and really just, you know, God was laying it on our hearts. Well, if you don't tell the story, mm -hmm. how do people know? First off, it wasn't you that changed your heart. Mm -hmm. God, God changed our hearts. Mm -hmm. it, we right. didn't do that. Mm -hmm. So if, how is he going to get the glory if we don't tell the other people what happened? So let's debunk a myth right here up front. Um, most of the time, people assume that something has to be really broken for a marriage to start falling apart. And by all appearances, you guys had everything together, right? I mean, from what I've researched, you had money. Mm -hmm. You had influence in your community you had good jobs um, and you were pretty much Barbie and Ken. Uh, you had some infertility issues, but then that even worked out. Now you have two beautiful girls and yet Cheryl, you had an affair. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? I mean, how does that just happen? Do you wake up one day pursuing that? Do you, does it just happen over time? What happened? Yeah. You know, um, first of all, I wasn't pursuing having an affair. Uh, I, I honestly never thought that I was capable of something like that. Um, about two years into the marriage, I started to feel really empty, and I really couldn't figure out why, mainly because, like you said, it looked like we had the perfect life. I mean, you know, we had great jobs, we had, you know, Ocean View Home, um, people called us Barbie and Ken. Um, you know, all of that, everything just seemed to work out for us. You know, it seemed like whatever we touched turned to gold. And so literally for me, I just felt like there was something wrong with me for feeling empty. Statistics will tell you many, many couples who get divorced immediately end up married again. Uh -huh. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just asking your thoughts on that. Jeff, why didn't you just start dating and yeah. decide, well, forget this. I mean, you know, she's going to leave. Mm -hmm. Why did you protect your heart? You know, I, was, from getting well, I don't into know that I was consciously protecting my heart. I was just so hurt. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. that I wasn't even capable of dating. You know, I was going to work, taking care of the girls. I had the girls half right, the time. And I was working with the high school youth of our church. And, and at first, you know, they invited me in. It was probably just for crowd control. I was in no position to teach, right? So, but about a year later, they asked me to take the young men through a book called The Disciplines of a Godly Man by Kent Hughes. And uh, I would study that book three or four days ahead of time, you know, before I was teaching them the lesson. And God was really just using that book to convict me that I wasn't this godly man in my marriage. And I didn't lead her, you know, I didn't serve her sacrificially. And I would tell these young boys this, these 14, 17 year old boys that, you know, do as God says, not as I did. I didn't do this in my marriage. And wow. I'm learning the same thing along with you just three or four days ahead of you. And then I started also attending a Friday morning men's Bible study. And it was at a local church, and it started at 6.30 in the morning. I'd, go, I'd roll out of bed, put a baseball cap on my head, pull it down over my face, sneak in like five minutes late, sit in the back of the room, and really didn't want to see anyone or meet anyone, just wanted to go and listen to God's Word. And they had just these amazing men of God, you know, just unpacking the Word of God. And as I learned what it looked like to be a leader and really just started, you know, searching my own heart and just praying to God to show me you know, show me where this went wrong. Show me what I own in this. And, you know, God just started unpacking and showing me these things. And, and I, I remember just opening up my Bible and I turned to Proverbs and I was flipping through it and I had Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 underlined. It was a passage I had memorized as a small child and it said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. 
And I interpreted that as God telling me that night, Jeff, you've been doing it your way for 36 years and you've been leaning on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. It's time for you to do it my way. And, and you chose to forgive yes, Cheryl. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Some would say to you, how could you possibly forgive? I mean, you, you really didn't do anything wrong, but yet you're saying the Holy Spirit began to reveal to you that you did do some things wrong. Well, I think what, uh, what he was revealing to me was it wasn't so much what I did, it was more about what I didn't do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I just didn't step up and lead, and, and I didn't, you know, I had a good dad. I knew what that looked like, but I was just prideful and stubborn and, you know, wanted to have a good time. I was more concerned about that <laughs> than anything, and so I, it was really just that powerful conviction over time, but it still wasn't an easy thing for me because I was so prideful. Mm -hmm. Did you have people in your life through the seven years that it took to, to win Jeff's heart again telling you, look, just give up? Oh, I mean, all my girlfriends. All my girlfriends. Yeah, it was kind of like Job's friends, you know, were telling him, he was, you know, how can you take all this, blah, blah, blah. That's what they were doing with me. Do you wish, now looking back, that you had forgiven sooner? Well, I think it was not an easy choice for me to do, but it was when I started realizing all the things that I hadn't done and how I hadn't taken my responsibility as a husband and what that looked like, and as God was showing me that. Wait, just, what do you mean you hadn't taken your responsibility as a husband? Because you're the one who's been wronged here. Right, well I never led her spiritually. I never led our girls spiritually up to that point. Um, you know, I wasn't the sacrificial servant in our home. You know, in Ephesians 5 it says to love your wife like Christ loved the church. <clears throat> you know, how did Christ love the church? He gave his life for us, right? And I, that wasn't me. And I didn't live with her in an understanding way like First Peter 3 talks about, or treating her as the weaker vessel. I never thought of her as the weaker vessel. She has a stronger personality than me, so she tend to kind of just, you know, <laughs> bowl over me. So uh, I never looked at her that way. And so when I started seeing all the things that I hadn't done, I started accepting responsibility for why the marriage had gone wrong, you know, mm -hmm. gone bad. Uh, it was hard for me to suck up my pride, but as God just started showing me how much he loved me and I started understanding my identity in Christ and just growing more and more in love with Christ. And when you do that, you want to be obedient. Mm -hmm. And it's not about us anymore. It's about me being obedient to Christ. It's not about who's winning. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, you know, exactly. And that's, we had lived our first marriage in competition. Mm -hmm. It was about who was winning, who could strike the biggest yeah. deal, who mm -hmm. could make the most money, all this. And it wasn't about that. You know, and God was showing both of us individually that he's the prize. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not about our marriage. And when we both got that is when things started coming back together in a healthy way. Because this is so exciting and, and God is absolutely amazing and capable of doing something like this. Mm -hmm. But we all know people who um, it's too late for them. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're hurting right now mm -hmm. as they're listening to this part of your story and thinking, I could have forgiven, I should have forgiven and now my spouse is remarried um, and it's too late. What do you say to them? How do you encourage their heart right now? Well, I think the thing is, you know, the joy, the joy that's in my heart and in Cheryl's heart really comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. So I mean, that's a great time to focus on and grow your relationship with Christ. We don't know what God's plan for your life is, but we do know that he wants you to love him. Mm -hmm. and, and he wants you to understand how much he loves you. So I would, I would encourage you to focus on your relationship with Christ and then just see what God has planned for you. Do you, do you still argue in your marriage? I mean, is everything perfect and you know, in the mountains of Colorado or do you have difficulties still today? We, we are a normal couple. We still <laughs> argue in our marriage, yes. We yeah. fight more in this marriage than we did in the first one. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's because we know marriage is worth, worth fighting, fighting for. Yeah. Um, do you, Jeff, speak specifically to the men of our church maybe that are in a difficult marriage right now and um, it's possible that they are refusing to go to counseling. Let's say it's the guy in the relationship that doesn't want to seek counseling because statistics will show that that's typically the case. Well, first I would try to love on him in a, in, a, in a masculine way, in a manly way, and find out what, what, what are you so afraid of? Like, mm -hmm. what is the fear? There's a fear there somewhere. Because it's never 100% one person's fault and zero the other. Mm -hmm. And then just really, do you understand your role as the husband? Do you understand your role as being the headship of your home and, and loving your wife sacrificially and uh, 
living with her in an understanding way. I think that passage in 1 Peter 3, 7 is one of the most challenging passages in the Bible for a husband. Yeah. We're to live with them in an understanding way. And just that first part of that verse for me says, what works today may not work tomorrow. <laughs> Wow. And I think God had a sense of humor too, and that's good. Because <laughs> you know what? He wants us to continue to pursue their hearts. Uh -huh. And so, like, don't give up. Pursue your wife's heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, the counseling thing, first of all, it, it can be one of the most you know, wonderful things where you can unlock something that maybe you're misunderstanding in the Bible or, or maybe you didn't have a correct teaching on it in the past or something like that. It can be a really healthy thing. Or maybe even never had a man to guide. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and so many men grew up without dads. I mean, if you think about it, how many in this generation and the, the generation that's being raised right now are growing up in a home without a dad, and maybe even with a present dad, but not being a spiritual leader. So, mm -hmm. so it's not weak to ask for help. No, mm -hmm. it's in fact it can probably be one that that's a sign of strength. Mm -hmm. Do you guys share passwords? Are there any, obviously oh don't keep secrets between you, right? right. Cell phone right. numbers, you can see my phone, I can see yours, right. this is my, these are my emails anytime you wanna yeah. see them. I mean, them. you could pull up my computer anytime. My phones, our phones are always we laying around. We're, we don't, we're, ours aren't even password protected. Yeah, I mean, we just, there's no, there's no hiding of anything. What would you say to a couple who they do right now, they're, they're sitting in this room right now and they have secrets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because you know, I'm going to quote my pastor, and he says, if you're 99% known, you're not fully known. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of us, we have these fears that if people know what's going on, what our thought life is, or what's going on in our life, that, you know, that they're going to reject us or maybe not understand. Right. And the reality is, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, our hearts are wicked. Who could know it? Our hearts are wicked above all else. Who could know it? And so we all are capable of making bad decisions. We all have a wicked heart. Mm -hmm. And the only good in us is Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> there's a couple things around that. One is talking about the importance of community. Mm -hmm. I know you guys have home groups here. I know right. some of your home group leaders. Right. And it's so important to be connected to a body of believers to where you can be real and authentic, to where other people know you. Mm -hmm. you can, and you can trust them that they're going to, uh, they're going to guide you in a, in a biblical way, and <clears throat> if you're if you're harboring the secret that you're afraid to tell your wife in a one-on-one -on -one situation, right. I don't know. And, you know, it's not cut and dried how to do it every time, but maybe you want to take a friend along with you, mm -hmm. or maybe you do want to go to your pastor or to your home group leader and sit down with them and your spouse and talk about or it. Or a counselor. I mean, yeah. Well, in John 10, 10 says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Mm -hmm. And I have come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. And, and God intends for us to have an abundant marriage. It doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't right. mean without suffering or trials. Right. But abundant meaning, you know, Happy. just rich. Yeah, rich, deep. a very rich, yeah. deep life. Um, and it starts with Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jeff, in closing today, and Cheryl, I'll ask you the same thing. We just have a couple of minutes left here. If you could say anything to the husbands in the room, obviously from marriages that are doing great right now and marriages that are dying right now. They're so discouraged. They're, they're entertaining divorce. They've been entertaining it for the last month. Uh, what would you say, just a general piece of encouragement, advice, challenge to the men in the room right now? Well, generally, I would, I would tell you to date your wife and to ask her how we're doing. And I say that because usually women are more relational than men. And as you heard Cheryl say, two years into the marriage, yeah, she had started emotionally divorcing me. Eight years into the marriage, I thought we had a perfect marriage. So there was six years that I was asleep at the wheel, right? Wow. So I think that's a great thing to be regularly ask your wife, how are we doing? And don't be afraid of her answer. And then if your marriage is on fire, get help. I mean, if you're in a place where you're thinking about divorce or whatever, get help. Go to your home group leader, go to your pastor, go to your caring pastor, go to a biblical counselor and get help. Don't, don't try to figure it out on your own. Even if you go alone, right. even if your spouse won't go with you, still right. go get help. Don't right. just stay stuck in it. I wish I had gone to a biblical counselor or to a pastor that could have you know, taken me through the Bible and shown me what my next steps would have been mm -hmm. or could have been. Cheryl, what piece of advice, encouragement, challenge would you say to the women? You have their attention right now. If you could say anything, again, not knowing their individual stories, but that's okay. It's just something general. What would you share with the women? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I would say is to work through the fear of it, whatever that looks like. Um, and, you know, pursue a loving, um, 
deep relationship with Jesus Christ, understanding what your role is as a godly woman. What did God have planned? Those are things that I didn't know. And, you know, again, it's get help. Jeff and I are very big on this is get help when things seem to be on fire. There isn't one marriage that doesn't go through trials. Uh, and so, you know, we see it every day. We've been counseling now for, you know, 14 years, you know, out of 15. And uh, there is just, there, every, every marriage goes through something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be an affair, but, you know, there are different times where we're not jiving. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to get help for that. Will you pray for the marriages in the room today? Some, like I said, who are hurting hearing your story because they, uh, they wish they would have known this. They wish you would have come six months ago even, three weeks ago even. Um, so there's some people that are hurting in this room. There's also some marriages that um, just need some encouragement. And, right. um, and then, then also the single people in the room who, uh, you know, like long for God to bring them their godly spouse. And right. would, you just, would you just pray over Hope Fellowship sure. before we leave today? I'd love to, you bet. So, Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you, God. And Father, uh, you created and designed marriage, God. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's a beautiful thing, Lord. So, Father, I lift up the marriages in Hope Fellowship, uh, everyone that's represented in this room, God. Mm -hmm. And, Father, I don't know where they are, but you do, Father. And you tell us in uh, Romans 12, 12 to rejoice in the hope and be patient in tribulation and constant in prayer, mm -hmm. Father. And, God, we know that Jesus Christ is our hope. So, Father, I pray that every marriage represented here would really turn to you first, Lord. Mm -hmm. And, Father, that they know uh, first that they would know how much you love them, Father. And, and really spend some time meditating on what you've done for us on the cross. And I know, Lord, sometimes in a church that sounds cliche, but there's nothing greater than what you did for us, Jesus, on the cross. Mm -hmm. And, Lord, and, and how you paid the price of our sins. And, and, Lord, and freed us up to walk in a new life, Lord. So, Father, we're so grateful for that. Father, I also pray um, for the singles in this room. Mm -hmm. And, Father, instead of spending so much time looking for the right person to marry, mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that they would take this time right now and just become the right person, mm -hmm. Lord, and really just grow in their relationship with you, Lord. And Father, um, I just pray blessings over this church. I pray for rich community. I pray for vulnerability. I pray for people to be honest and real about where they are, God, and that if they need help, that they would seek it, Lord. And Father, you tell us in Matthew 6, to seek ye first the kingdom of God, and Lord, all these things will be added unto you. And so, Father, I pray that over this church. We love you, God. We praise you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.